So, hello. So you know what's coming up right now, so let's start right away. What is that evolution? So SQL started actually in 1974. And, well, I don't have the time to start from that point on. So I will skip immediately to um, 92. Because in 92 there was a standard released, SQL 92. Has any one of yet you ever heard about this SQL 92? Give me a sign. Yeah, quite a few. So what was the big deal about SQL 92? Um, at that time, SQL was kind of complete. It was rounded. It, it has everything it urgently needed when you just look at the relational idea. And this was a limiting factor at that time, the relational idea. And that idea is actually two things. On the one hand, we have the relational data model. You might know that already. And at that time, it was defined to cope with atomic types. I will come back to that later. So one of the ideas was that you build these tables, relations, and you can put in values of atomic types in there. And if you do proper normalization, and that was the other idea on that side, then you would normalize in such a way that you design the persistent data model to be a good fit for the data itself, just the data, not what you plan to do with the data. That's a big difference. Forget about where the data is coming from and what you will later on do with the data. Just make the data model a good place to live for the persistent data. That was the idea. You might know all of these normalization levels, first form, second form, and so on. That's not actually so important. Here we are just talking about the first normal form. That's the really important one. And one consequence of this normalization was actually that you split up things in, in different tables so that every piece has a good place to live there, not taking into consideration what you plan to do with that data. I will come back to that idea later on. One consequence, and I must say an unfortunate consequence, is that it is hard to cope with data stored in such a model. Because all the data, even for a single business case, is spread across many, many tables. Therefore, there is the second side of this relational idea. At that time, it was the relational algebra, a tool set to do transformations based on these relations, on these tables, so that you can conveniently, at runtime, transform the persistent data stored in a persistent data model to a, a form which is more suitable for the, uh, for the task you have at hand right now. So this is how you process the data there. You store it in one persistent data model that doesn't care about what you do with it, and then you just transform it on the fly so that it is more convenient to process. And as you know, you have many different things you need to do with the same data. That's really important. The data does not change as quick as what we want to do with the data. That's the reason why we do this separation there. Because persistent data, no, no matter in which way you store it, let it be relational databases, let it be JSON documents, schema-less databases. Once you have accumulated, let's say, terabytes of data, it's hard to change the model of the data you have already stored. It doesn't matter whether it's relational or schema-less or whatever. What you have stored already is hard to change. That's the idea. So design that whole thing in such a way that we don't need to change the persistent layout, or only barely, like adding a new column, adding a new table. And then for all the requirements that change all over the day, like the requirements really change from one second to the other one, just use this dynamic transformation language to transform this persistent data model that needs hardly uh, any change to something which is just more convenient to get the job done for the requirement which is uh, extremely urgent right now, but completely outdated next week. So this is basically one of the huge ideas behind SQL. And at that time, in 92, that idea was already there. The only problem was that it was limited to the relational idea, to the relational data model and the relational algebra. And this has changed. This is the evolution I want to talk about. So the next standard release, so I'm talking about an international standard here. It's an ISO standard, 1975, if somebody uh, cares about the number. The next standard was released in 99. 
And that starts with great news. The relational data model is dead. That was the actual title of a paper published around the time when the standard came out. So what does it say? It's dead. The relational data model is dead. Um, I will come to the, to the details in a minute. I'll just first give you two teasers, two quotes to get the idea. The first one is to say, uh, to say that these SQL 99 extensions are more extended interpretations. I really like that term here, extended interpretations of the relational data model is like saying an intercontinental ballistic missile is merely an extended interpretation of a spear. So you see, extended interpretation is an interesting um, concept to, to, to use there, because an intercontinental missile is definitely something more than just an extended interpretation. But this is the, the, the fundamental change that happened there on the, on the standard side. And the second quote is, with SQL 99 you can get the best of both worlds, and of course you can get the worst of both worlds. It's up to the database practitioners. That's us. It's up to us to choose which one is a better fit. So there is not the one single correct solution anymore. There are options, and we can choose from them. So let's go into the details. What does it mean? On the model side, what has changed there? And that's a quite funny story here. So I like to, to quote Chris Date because Chris Date wrote many, many books on topics like that, so it's easy to find quotes. And he wrote, I was as confused as anyone else. And if somebody like Chris Date, a really uh, big name in that scene, is confused, then it is, that's a pretty alarming sign. So what was he confused about? It's about these atoms. There was a huge discussion at that time. So the relational data model said what you can put into a single cell has to be an atomic value. And then, of course, people were coming up and saying, OK, uh, I know you mean something like a string, like a date, like a number. But frankly speaking, a string is not atomic. You can chop it into its characters. It's not atomic. So I know what you mean, but that word does just not say what you mean. So let's find a better definition there. And that took quite a while. Um, but then Chris Date wrote on, by the early 1990s, however, it's seen the light. Domains can contain anything. So this is an actual quote. And it means, in our, in our language, it means types can be anything. Values can be anything. Anything. So they were actually searching for another word to describe what can be put into a single cell. And they found out, well, anything. They just dropped this atomic requirement, and it turns out that all the science which was building on this atomic definition, the, the different layers of normalization, they still hold true. Nothing collapsed. It's still fine. And this is the fundamental change that was taking up with SQL 99. So SQL 99 introduced rich data types. Of course, we can still use the atomic values, and they are, I would say, even the most interesting ones for the persistent data model. But we do have arrays now, and they do not break the relational data model. They do not break any law. They don't break SQL. They are just fine. We also have nested tables. Not that I like them, but well, we have them. Um, more interestingly, we have composite types. So we can now combine for a monetary type, for example, the, the value, the numeric value, together with the currency symbol into one type. And then you have one column of that monetary type. And when you do the transformations, you even enjoy the type safety of SQL. So that was on the model side. And on the transformation side, we are not limited to the rel relational algebra anymore. We have a completely different set of operations. Of course, the relational algebra is still there. Joins are still useful. But it's not the only answer. It's not a limiting factor anymore. And one example I would like to show you here is this one. It's a hierarchy. You might um, have seen something like this. So this is basically the table definition. And for each row, which is represented by a block in this chart, it has a pointer to its parent. So you can build a hierarchy. And then you might have questions like, 
If I know this node, how can I find all these nodes? And how to do that in SQL? So let's try. Let's say we know the, the first node by its ID. So maybe I'm, I'm specifying something like 42 in here. The question mark is just a placeholder for the bind parameter. So let's imagine there's 42 in there. So I get that one red um, node. And then, even with SQL 92, I could already use union all to add more rows to the same result set. And here I'm doing a small trick. I'm using the same ID, 42 basically, to search on the parent column so that I get the second layer there. And as far as it goes to SQL 92, this is now pretty much game over. Even though we could make more union all, union all, union all, the problem is we cannot easily find that ID there. Because for the second level, we know it must refer to the first level. Okay, that's easy, we know that value. But for the further uh, levels, it becomes a little bit um, yeah, not realistically solvable. What we would actually like to express in some way in SQL is that, well, whatever you're getting out there, it's the same ID, basically. This, the ID from one level is basically the search term for the next level. So whatever we are getting out, we want to search on again. This is what we would like to implement there. And it turns out the syntax is quite short in SQL. Here it is. That's the entire syntax. You can copy and paste it into your, your database. It works. What it effectively does is indirectly referring to its own output and therefore just reprocessing its output so that in one go you get all of these nodes there. You just get a straight list of all of these things. You send one query over to the data database, you get the entire result back in one go. And that's called recursion in SQL and we have it in the international standard since 99. That's 20 years. Who has not seen that before? Mm -hmm. 20 years. On the other hand, the international standard is just a piece of paper. It just lays out what, what vendors could do and what they, they could follow and how they could do it. But it doesn't enforce them to do it. So therefore, I have these slides for you, which show which of these major database systems support this feature for how long now. And now you see, quite recently, the open source scene has uh, caught up. And nowadays, every major SQL database supports that feature. So these are the seven top-ranked SQL databases on dbengines.ranking.com if you cross out access, which I don't consider an SQL database. OK, so that was the 99 standard was really a uh, breaking change, to say. It was really a big deal. But I have to go on because later standards even introduced more interesting features. Like in 2003, we have got um, what was hip at that time, XML. Who is using XML? OK, just out of curiosity, who is using JSON? Ah, more. So I have something about JSON later on there. So, but at that time, in 2003, we have got um, schema-less support. So 2003 was the year when SQL became a document store. The breaking change there was that we could now have a single column where the structure of the contents is different in every single row. That was the breaking change. Before, we just had a single column, uh, let's say, of arrays, and array of the same type, or of a monetary type. So the same type in every row. Here we still have the same type, but the type is XML, which is flexible. So we can have something completely different in every row. So this was the, the breaking change at that time. In the meanwhile, of course, we have JSON support. Therefore, I will tell you something about JSON later on. And on the transformation side, we have got what is called window functions. Who knows SQL window functions? Ah, quite a few. That's good. Who doesn't? Who doesn't know window functions? OK. Um, I'll fix that. It was several times extended, and it's even popular among the more modern SQL databases, or even non-SQL databases. I'll show you just the most simplistic, sim simple example I can think of. So I have a query here. It's selecting two columns of a table T, which is basically about transactions. And you see the, the, the contents there. And what I would like to do is I would like to add another column which has the balance if these are transactions, like uh, account 
cash account. So if I put in 10, then the balance is 10 when it starts with zero. And if I add another 20, then it becomes 30, and so on, and so on, and so on. How to do that? And of course, it was already possible with SQL 92, because one of the strong points of SQL 92 was composability. Like a Lego system, you could can put together queries into more complex queries and make fancy stuff. Like here, you could just write a subquery in the select clause to select all the transactions that are before up to this transaction and do the accumulation. Okay, it's easy, but it's technically a self-join. I will tell you why this is bad a little bit later. Nowadays, we can use aggregate functions without doing grouping at the same point in time. This was a limitation of SQL 92, that when you want to use an aggregate function, like sum, min, max, and so on, then you have to do a uh, grouping at the same level of the query. And this limitation has been lifted. Now we can use aggregate functions like sum without grouping, but instead of the group by clause, which also implies over which uh, rows the, the aggregation is done, we have to specify it in another way over which rows the aggregation has to be done. And that, that's also the keyword, over. So instead of having a group by at the end, we have an over clause right after the aggregate function. And in there, we specify over which rows the aggregate function shall be applied. And it starts quite interestingly with order by. And I find that quite a funny because, well, the last time I checked, 1 plus 2 and 2 plus 1, they were quite similar in the result. So why should we order there if you just want to sum them up? And the point is, well, it's not about that. It's about we are specifying which rows to accumulate. That's what the, order by, uh, the over clause is about. And we are going to use terms like before and after quite soon. And for these terms to make sense, we need to agree on an order with the database. So that basically means, listen, database, I will soon use before and after. And when I do so, this is the order I'm referring to. And then we can say, apply the, the accumulation over all the rows between unbounded preceding. That is the very first according to that order. and the current row. And that current row, that's different for each row. That means when the database is looking at the first row, unbounded preceding is the first row, the current row is the first row, so that's the only row that is, that is summed up, so 10, easy. But when it goes on to the second row, the unbounded preceding is still the first row, but the current row is not a second row. So these two rows are piped into the aggregate function, so you get 30, and so on and so on, and so on. And that's it. No subquery, no self-join, just straight describing what do you want to have. And that's really just the most simple case what you can think of. You can use all the aggregate functions you know in there, like average. You can do things like rows between three preceding and three following, like giving you a moving average. You get the idea? So that was in 2003. Can you use that in your database yet? Depending on what you're using, but most likely, yes. Even if you're not using one of these main databases, BigQuery, Heave, Impala, Spark, Nudeb, anyone using any of these bubble databases in there? Yeah, you can use it, go ahead. Did you know that already? Uh, half of them, I guess. So it, it's there, it's an international standard, it's a sound concept, it's widely applied, just go use it. Another example I would like to give you. Inverse distribution functions, percentiles. It's a really funny example, median. Just keep it simple, median. So the middle value of an ordered set. You order something and then you take the middle one. How to do that in SQL 92, in the purely relational world of thinking? How would you do that? Oh, that's easy, isn't it? That's just the middle value. This is the result that's actually a textbook solution for this problem in SQL 92, if you are limited to the relational idea, which we are not anymore. So what is it doing? It's basically numbering the rows and doing a self-join for that. Here we have it again, self-join. And then it's picking the middle one. And if you look carefully, you see that the same data 
is the same table is accessed three times. Twice up here to number the rows, and then once, um, where is it here, here, um, to pick the middle one. Three times, two self-joins. Isn't that great? This is the power of SQL 92, composability. You can solve any problem. It's just getting like a little bit ugly and non-performing and non-intuitive and yeah, bad. Let's face it. That's one of the reasons why SQL is not so popular, because of this limited mindset. At that time, 20, 30 years ago, it was the relational model, the relational algebra was really great because a very limited set of operations could technically solve almost all problems. So various dump databases could do anything. That was great at that time. Remember back 30 years, how much RAM did we have? How much CPU did we have? Simple algorithms were important at that time. In the meanwhile, of course we have something more advanced and we have also more advanced databases, so we can use more advanced features there. And at that time, when you, uh, when you are limited to the relational algebra, there are many problems that need a self-join for a solution. Therefore, the self-join, joining data to itself, accessing the same data multiple times in a single query, that was a textbook solution at that time. There's even a name for it, self-join. Quite often it was said, oh yeah, no problem, you can solve that using a self-join. But that was SQL 92. That's not true anymore. For pretty much every problem we used to use a self-join, there's a better solution now. Like just before, I've shown you this window functions in the over clause. In SQL 92, you use a subquery for that or another self-join. But you need to access the same data twice. But now we have this over clause. It's easier and faster. No self-join anymore. Here we are accessing the same data three times. At that time, it was OK. But nowadays, it's not. There are better solutions for that. And therefore, I tell you, all employees must wash hands after using self-joins. <laughs> because nowadays, you should really feel dirty if you use them. Wash your hands. It's like oil. It's really it's hard to get off. It's, uh, it's not like that every single self-join is wrong, just the vast majority of them. So almost everyone. There's for pretty much everyone a better solution. So therefore, think about that. Um, I have stickers and coasters with this um, sujet up there. When you go to outside where the bottles are placed, just grab your stickers and coasters and wash your hands afterwards. <laughs> so what is the nowadays solution? Of course, we have a function for that. It's the percentile disk function. It takes one argument in the range from 0 to 1. So 0 0.5 is the median. Um, we have to order by something, of course. And uh, there are even two functions of them, because if there's a percentile disk, then there's also another one, there's a percentile cont. And if you need that kind of function, then you will understand the difference quite easily. So the discrete function gives you one value that actually exists in that result set. So if we think about four rows and asking for the median for the middle one, which is it, uh, row two or three? And that's well defined, of course. It's the, the first one in percentile disk. And if you use the percentile cont, you will get an automatic interpolation between the two nearby rows you're missing. So that was also introduced in SQL 2003. Can you use that? Uh, well, yeah, yeah, it's just the truth, okay? I'm just the ambassador, I'm just telling you the truth. Um, nevertheless, there's also movement in BigQuery and this more modern SQL dialects and implementation. Okay, then I'm skipping over a few releases of the, of the standard. I, I would like to go immediately to, to the um, most recent standard version, 2016. So if you have wondered what is the current release of the SQL standard, it's 2016. And the next one is already in the works. It's um, coded 22x, and it is expected to be there either in 2020 or 2021. So one year, two years about. So what was new there? JSON. I told you JSON will come up here. So what is JSON? JSON is the document format. And to be honest, you could always store JSON documents in SQL databases because JSON documents are just character strings. The big difference now is that SQL has now a semantic understanding of what these things mean. Like this, this 
um, brackets and parentheses and the quoting and the colon, what that means. It can now understand. So, so you can now ask, is this a JSON document? And you will get yes or no. You can ask, what type of document is it? And that in that example, you will get array as an answer. And then you can even ask, how many elements does it have? And so on and so on and so on. And of course, you can transform. Because if you remember what I said at the beginning, the persistent data model is hard to change. So the idea is to avoid the need to change it. In such a way, even if we want to have a different data format in our front end, that we don't need to change the on this layout. Transformation, remember? So the question is, how can we bridge between this document world of, of thinking and, and this, this um, table world of, of data modeling? And there are functions for that. And this is the example I would like to show. How can I use SQL to transform that JSON document into a more tabular form like you see there? And it's actually quite easy. There's a function for that. It's called JSON table. Here it is. It's a table function, so it returns an entire table. And I will go through it. It's, it's quite simple. You see, it's declarative. You are just mapping. The first thing is the question mark, which I always use as the placeholder for some data you're sending from the client over to the database. In this example, I'm sending that JSON document over there. So this is sent from the client to the database. The database will process it. The next parameter is a so-called SQL JSON path expression. And that's pretty much the same like XPath for XML. Who knows XPath? Yeah. Or if you don't know XPath, uh, maybe CSS selectors for HTML. Who knows that? CSS selectors for HTML. Yeah, okay. So the idea is basically you have a document and you have a language which you can use to pinpoint elements out of this document. And for JSON, we have a new path language. It's called SQL JSON path. And here this example, dollar square brackets asterisk, it basically means start at the root, take an array, and take all the elements. So this expression will hit these two objects, these two JSON objects. And this also determines the number of rows we are getting out from this function. Because we are hitting two objects or two elements, we will get two rows. So each of that is turned into a row. And now that we have specified the rows, the only thing that's left is to specify the columns. And of course, we say names, types, like we know it from SQL. And again, we can use this path express expression language to tell where to take the data from, like here in the attributes ID and A1. And there are many more options there, like you can set defaults and you can error handling and all of that. It's all there. It's just um, not on the slide. And that's it. A great but pointless example. Yeah, well, look, um, I said the question mark is basically data coming from the client, and then I'm selecting star everything back to the client. And no, that's not what I mean how to use SQL databases. No, 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 no. What I mean is to still use SQL 92, to combine that into something more useful, because it's still composable. And we can combine insert with select. And now it makes quite a lot of sense because we are sending a JSON document over the wire to the database. The database is tra transforming it into a tabular form and directly loading it into a table. No need to loop over anything in the client code. So I find that quite useful. And of course, the mapping in the other way is also there. It's just a little bit more code because you need to, uh, to nest it for the aggregation and so on. But it's there. The mapping back and forth, it's all there. So that is SQL 2016. Can you use it in your database? Uh, 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 yeah, well. <laughs> Soon, maybe. So for MariaDB, there is a ticket tagged for the next year's release. And for Postgres, there's a patch. Anyone using Postgres or MariaDB? So it's on the horizon. It's not yet there, but on the horizon. So you see, uh, there's quite some more dynamic movement right now. Database vendors are taking these things up because they are handy. So I'm running out of time. So what I need is a time machine. Let's go back in time. Who would like to go back in time with me? Yeah. That's what we all would like to have, a time machine. So I'm going back in time to 2011 when another release of the standard happened. 
And there we have got time traveling. And we have got a lot of it. We have got two kinds of time traveling, which can be used independently or combined. The so-called application versioning. What is it? It's basically, what, what does it mean, time traveling? It's basically about things like keeping track of changes. When clients, customers, whoever, change, let's say, their name, when you just update it, then the old data is gone. This is the old way of SQL. And now we have a way where we can keep the old data and then later on ask for how did that data look like at that point in time, time travel queries, on two time accesses. So the first one is application versioning, and that is used to model how the real world actually evolved. For example, if somebody is changing their name due to, let's say, marriage, they're marrying, great. So wh wh when you have done your marriage, and when, you, when, when you married, when you signed the documents at the authorities, basically, the first thing you need to do is you take the documents and run to all your business partners, like banking, insurance, telephone, to tell them, listen, my name has changed right now, today. Enter it into your system right now. No. Honeymoon. Honeymoon. Several weeks far away. And when we come back after honeymoon, weeks later, we will take the document and mail it maybe to all our business partners. So they will learn about it weeks later. But they still want to add into their system, like that name has changed, but not now, but also three, already three weeks ago. So this is what application versioning is there to model, how the real world changed independently of how we learned about these changes. There's quite a new syntax, I won't show it because of time. And then there's the other kind of versioning, the system versioning. I will demo that a little bit. The system versioning is not model how the real world changed, but it's modeling how we learned about these changes. Like if we learn about today that your name has changed three weeks in the past, then we record, okay, we only learned about this today. And that can be used to explain why in the time between, in those three weeks, we have still mailed you something with the old name on. Okay, and the great thing about system versioning, and that's also the name, why, the reason why it's called system versioning, is we can delegate everything there to the system, to the database system. There is only very little syntax; it's mostly transparent. I'll show you. So it's a table-by-table -table decision. You can decide on table level. I would like to have that system versioning on that table, and then you need to prepare that table a little bit. So you have this from and till timestamps, which basically says this row version is valid from here till there, but we delegate the maintenance of these columns to the database, generated always as row start and row end. And then we need a little bit more syntax sugar to make the magic work. And we use this table as though it was a normal table. We don't even uh, care about these two columns. We just insert without mentioning these two columns, but still the system takes care to set them correctly. So if I insert at 10 o'clock, then it will be recorded starting from 10 o'clock, this it, uh, information was correct. And if I do an update, magic happens. Nothing is overwritten. We get a new row version, and they are just properly tagged. So if I run that update at 11 o'clock, the old record is valid from 10 to 11, and the new one starts at 11. And of course, if I delete something, nothing is deleted. It's still there, it's just hidden due to this visibility. So if you query from that table after deleting from it, you will get an empty result because it was deleted. It's transparent. One of the main ideas there is that you don't need to change your application to take advantage of that. And then there is a little bit special syntax to do the time traveling. So because it is a table by table decision, after the table name, we say, we would like to view into this table as though it was that time, for system time as of that point in time. And then, yeah, we can get the old data. And there's, of course, more syntax, like we can go get all the versions from the beginning of all time, and so on, and so on, and so on. It's all there. Can you use that yet? Who would like to use that? Yeah, everybody would like to. So, I'm sorry, this is not a disappointing slide. So the commercial databases have that for quite some while in the meanwhile. The open source, well, MariaDB. Who is using MariaDB? 
not so many, ah, a few. So you could use that if you are using 10.3 or more recent. Uh, MariaDB has even started to introduce the application versioning features in the this year's release, but it's quite incomplete. So it, I think it will need one or more, one or two more releases until it is usable. But it's coming. The other vendors are thinking about that as well. So I'm running out of time, I guess. So I need to come to an end. What is it about? Here, I took a picture of the SQL standard for you. It's a 2016 edition. Uh, quite a, a stack of paper. And, well, it's actually just one part of it, part number two. It has nine parts. <laughs> um, so that part is, is um, the, the most relevant one. It has 1,700 pages out of 4,000 the entire SQL standard has today. Well, it's not that this is a, a really useful benchmark, but pages of specification, it's a strange benchmark, like lines of code, okay? It's not, not scientifically useful, but it gives you an impression. So what I would like to give you as an impression here is, currently the SQL standard consists of 4,000 pages. SQL 92 has had 750 pages. So that's a roughly 20% of what it is today. In other terms, SQL is fi five times as much as it used to be with SQL 92. A lot has happened since SQL 92. I could show you only a few features, a few selected features in there. There are many, many more features. Uh, it has truly evolved beyond the relational idea. I think this is the most important message in here. If you think about relational databases, it's actually a bad term. That's the reason why in this paper, the great news, the relational data model is dead. The paper actually proposed that we should stop saying the relational data model because it's confusing, because extended interpretation is not the right word for it. We should start saying it's the SQL database. It's a multi-model database, whatever, but not relational because that's just giving you the wrong uh, picture in your head. And last but not least, if you use SQL only to do CRUD operations, mostly on the primary key, like picking single rows, updating single rows, deleting single rows, and so on, then you're not using SQL. You might use its syntax, but non you're not using the idea, because the idea from the beginning, and this has not changed, was that we have a hard-to-change persistent data model which we would like to conveniently transform on the fly into something more useful for our task at hand. Let it be a different relational combination of several tables or let it be a JSON document. That doesn't matter. But the strength of SQL is to, this, to do this transformation part. Therefore, I say SQL is not a query language. It's not only a query language. We have seen query languages today, or we have talked about them. XPath is a query language. It takes out a part of a document. That's a query. You can do that with SQL as well, but then you're leaving out the useful part of SQL. The useful part is to do these transformations for you. And therefore, SQL is more than a query language. It's more importantly a data transformation language. My name is Markus Wienand. I'm the SQL Renaissance Ambassador. I run this website, modernsql.com, where you can read about features like this. It's basically a blog. It's going to be a book, but I'm first publishing it for free on the blog. So just um, follow it. I'm also on Twitter. There's also a Twitter account, Modern SQL. And I think I have to say thank you and take up some questions. Okay.